What is up, movie friends? Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast. I'm Anthony. And I'm James, and this is episode 55. We're going to be doing some modern sci-fi films. This is like part two to this uh, little uh, uh, series we have going on. In this episode, we're going to be doing Arrival, District 9, Looper, and Source Code. And Source Code, we've talked about a little bit before in our Jake Gyllenhaal episode, but we're going to go more in-depth on the themes and the filmmaking process of the of that movie. Yeah, and these are some of my favorite sci-fi films of the of the century so far. They're all fantastic. A few got Oscar nominations, and they're all very different from one another. They uh, ask questions about different ideas of technology and science and simulation and, and futurism and time travel. So they all have, they tackle different themes and ideas, which I really like. So it's a very varied list of stories that yeah. we're going to talk about. I love sci-fi films, and... Um, I think Arrival is probably the best of all four of these movies. I think Arrival is probably a masterpiece, a borderline masterpiece, just like Denise. All of his films are like that. And uh, it's a really complex film that really dives more than, than just aliens coming to Earth. And then District 9 also has aliens coming to Earth, but in a different way and, and similar themes, but in a different style where that's more about the apartheid and uh, segregation and uh, social classism throughout the world. And then Source Code, very cool alternate reality film. Um, Simulations. Yeah, directed by Duncan Jones, David Bowie's son. And then Looper, uh, Ryan Johnson. He's a very good director. I love Knives Out. I know a lot of people don't like The Last Jedi, but he's still a really good director. Um, he made The Brothers, Bro Bloom. Yeah, Brick. And then Brick with, Ryan, uh, with Joseph Gordon-Levitt. And Looper is just a really freaking cool movie, and I love it. Yeah, this is this is an excellent list, and I'm excited to talk about oh, it. I can't with wait. With great directors, too. All, yeah. all these directors are just some of the top directors that are working today. And again, very unique directors too. Yeah, and I think out of these, I think um, Source Code might be my favorite. I think it's a really brilliant movie and it's so fun and I think it's just a genius story. It's so great, but let's get into it. The first film on our episode is Arrival, which was directed by Denis Villeneuve and was released October 11th, 2016, written by Eric Hesserer. The film stars Amy Adams, Jeremy Renner, and Forrest Whitaker. This film grossed $203 million on a, on a budget of $47 million. When 12 spacecrafts mysteriously appear around the globe, a renowned linguist is called in to attempt communication with the alien visitors. With the world's various militaries chomping at the bit for a conflict, she works to decipher the alien's language and intentions, but finds their words altering the very substance of her thoughts. Like I said, Arrival, near-perfect film, if not it's a modern classic in the sci-fi genre. Um, borderline masterpiece, Denis Villeneuve, one of the best filmmakers working. I mean, if you saw Blade Runner 2049 and you're amped up for Dune, like, Enemy's amazing. Every movie this guy makes is phenomenal. Well, he was on a huge streak because his first major big film was Incendies, which is a French-Canadian foreign film that came out, I think, 2009. And then after that, he literally made Enemy, Prisoners, This and Blade Runner 2049, like, back to back to back to back. Insane. This guy had an insane, like, unbelievable six years as a filmmaker. His filmography is becoming one of the best of all time. I'm sure once he's done directing and, yeah. and retires, he's going to be known as one of the greatest directors to ever live. Yeah. But everything about Arrival, to me, is flawless. The performances from Amy Adams, Jeremy Renner, Forrest Whit Whitaker are all excellent. The cinematography by Bradford Young, yeah. who did Selma, mm -hmm. uh, amazing. This is a visually stunning movie. And uh, Bradford Young also shot Solo, and he helped create the new Star Wars aesthetic that you see in like Mandalorian and the other what's the other solo Rogue One yeah um it's called shooting in the toe which means you shoot it because they're shooting digital cameras very sensitive now so a lot of the new Star Wars shows and movies are very dark and very minimal lighting because he kind of began that with his filming of this movie in Solo so he put his stamp on the new Star Wars uh, texture and color yeah and the, the cinematography in this movie is just Every shot is beautiful. Uh, these massive landscapes with just like the ships hovering, and it's it's a, the aesthetics are amazing. And then the music by Johan Johansson is phenomenal and eerie and and dark, but also at times meditative. And uh, he's gone too soon. Uh, rest in peace, Johan, because yeah. he, he made some amazing scores. But I think this might be his best one. Well, the thing with this score is it is brilliant, but the most uh, famous piece of music in the movie isn't his. It's yeah. Max Richter's on uh, I can't remember what it's called on the on the something of daylight or something. And they at the use, end, at the end, yeah. It's in the beginning, in the end. And uh, unfortunately, Johan's score was so great, it wasn't allowed to be uh, Oscar nominated because Max Richter's song was used so heavily in the film, it became an idea. If, if, if a different song is used too much in a movie, 
that composer who composed the rest of the music, they can't get nominated for anything. So it, it bumped him out of the category. But that song, Max Richter's song, especially at the emotional climax of this movie, it just gives you goosebumps every time you see it. Yeah, and this movie, Arrival, is based on the novel Story of Your Life by Ted Chang. And uh, the novel is a little different, but they obviously adapted it for the film in, in different ways. And when I go to see a sci-fi film, I want to experience something I've never seen before. And... Whether it's it's similar to other movies, that's fine. But I want to I want to see it done differently. Like we've we've seen the movies of aliens coming down to Earth. Obviously, District Nine is a, is a different example. But then like the day the Earth stood still, I feel like the day the Earth stood still wanted to be what Arrival became because I think Arrival is the epitome of of the, the best movie of aliens coming to Earth and and trying to integrate somehow with humankind. And you're talking about the original one in the 40s, and, not the, and, not the Keanu both, one. Both of them. <laughs> And so, yeah, you're right. It, it, it was a new approach to it. And also, it was a new approach to the idea of time travel because time travel is uh, ends up becoming one of the main themes of this movie, but it's not the time travel we're used to. It's a different kind of uh, way of thinking about traveling through time uh, mentally and you're experiencing time because uh, eventually throughout this film, as we watch more and as Amy Adams' character, Louise, learns more about the alien language, she learns that the alien language is... Um, isn't held back by time and it is a circle and so the circle is uh, the main theme of this movie I think and eventually gets to the point where um, as you learn this language like Luis does the more you learn it the more you're it's kind of like I think all I think it alters her mind and her brain as she learns the language because then she starts once she starts uh, learning the language she begins experiencing what we think are flashbacks but are actually flash forwards to the future with her daughter and so she is starting to experience time on a on like a flat circle as well and so she's not like traveling through time but her her lifetime is now a circle it's not point a to point b and so i think that's one of the main themes of the film and it's a really interesting way to think about traveling through time not physically but in your mind and mentally yeah this episode of raiders of the lost podcast is brought to you by manscaped the leaders in men's below the waist grooming Get 20% off your order and free shipping using coupon code Raiders of the Lost at checkout. Again, Raiders of the Lost at checkout for 20% off and free shipping year round from manscaped.com. Manscaped's been awesome. They've sent us literally every product they have. Their their luxury lawnmower groomer is the best I've ever used. It's, it's got awesome. a it's got a flashlight on it and it's waterproof. Who thought of this? What a genius, this guy. <laughs> Manscaped, I don't know who you're paying. Your engineers give him a bonus. No more CVS clippers. So, guys, grooming's a part of life. Taking care of your body, visually, aesthetically, and and scent wise is really important. Girls appreciate it. Yeah, girls really do appreciate it, and guys appreciate it too. Yeah. So use our coupon code Raiders of the Lost at checkout for twenty percent off and free shipping year round at Manscaped.com. Get it. Just a heads up: if you haven't seen this movie, there's gonna be some spoilers, especially in this film that you you don't want to hear spoilers for this movie. You haven't seen it. Yeah. And so what you're basically referring to is the Sapper Wharf hypothesis, which basically means that. If you learn and study a foreign language long enough, you basically rewire your your brain and the yeah. way you think physically, yeah, to determine uh, how how you now you you perceive the world differently. And because this language now determines how you think, and so as you said, as Doctor Banks Louise learns more about this alien language, she becomes to she begins to acquire the knowledge of how they think. And like you said, they experience time differently, more in a circle rather than we're humans and when we experience the present constantly we're always in the present we we experience time linear but as you can tell by just the the language that they that they write with with the ink and it's circular too and it's almost like a palindrome it goes backwards and forwards so mm-hmm. and her daughter's name is Hannah so yeah, palindrome yeah that's a palindrome too and then also spoiler alert the, the the greatest thing i think about this film obviously when we get to the climax and we start to understand everything is the fir- the opening of this movie is of this this woman Louise and her daughter her daughter's birth and then her her daughter's uh, h- horrible sickness and disease and, and early death. And, and it's interesting because the first time you watch this, obviously, we're human. Again, we're experiencing time linear. So we're, we're thinking this t- this movie experiences time the same way as us. And so that means that we think that Luis's daughter b- died before the events of the film. So these are her thinking about flashbacks of her daughter. And Denis does a really clever thing is... When we finally see Louise later, like at at the college, she mm-hmm. seems like distraught or or cut off from the world. She doesn't even pay attention to the news broadcast. She seems she seems hollow inside. And when the first time you watch this, you're like, it's because she's mourning the death of her child. But mm-hmm. what we've learned eventually is that, and she even says a couple lines, like she says, "Who is this child?" Um, 
and and these are like little hints that the the beginning of the movie is actually the end, but also the other way around because it's all a circle. So she hasn't mm-hmm. had this child who she's having visions of yet. But as she learns that language, as she learns the alien language, that's why she's seeing these visions before she's even encountered the aliens. Because she will encounter the aliens and she will learn the language. So her mind is already going to be, it's already predetermined that she's going to fall into this loop of a circle of time travel. And she, I think that she's feeling, I think that, because you're right, it's smart to point out how in her first scenes she seems very distant and um, distraught, and I think it's because uh, she's feeling the loss of her daughter, but she hasn't experienced it yet. But she's feeling those feelings and those emotions, even though it happens years down the line. So I think because she ends up becoming in a in a looped timeline with herself, um, she's she hasn't experienced these moments, but she's feeling the emotional aftermath of them. And she also has another great line in the beginning of the film where she says. I used to think that this was the beginning of your story. We're so bound by time. And so she, again, isn't really understanding yet what's going on. Yeah. And I just want to say that I think Amy Adams is one of the best actors working right now. Uh, she's got six Oscar nominations, and she hasn't won yet. But she's, time and time again, she gives delivers amazing performances with, with very varied characters. She has so much range. And with this film, she carries it completely on her shoulders. Yes, the production is great. Cinematography uh, the supporting cast is good, but uh, all in all, it's a very simple story with uh, very minimal locations. And for the most part, the camera's on Amy Adams in the close-up. And you are watching her experience these events, and she's such a great actor where she can portray so much emotion um, just with her face without speaking. And you can tell, like, there's a lot going on in her head as the character, even though she's not saying anything. And I think that she's one of the greatest actors at portraying someone thinking and emoting without showing it off too much. Yeah, she's very vulnerable in this film and has also a tenderness. But also, it's ironic that she points out, too, in the film that she's this renowned linguist and expert at at language and communication. But she herself doesn't know how to communicate. It kind of reminds me of of Sean in Google Hunting where he's teaching um, psychology and he says he's like I teach this stuff and I didn't say I know how to do it and so <laughs> she's a poor communicator in human in real life and a lot of this film is about communication and it's what links us but, but what happens to that when those chains of communication break down and we see that just in, in small circle situations where you know all these doctors and military personnel are they can't get along and they're fighting in these little rooms and they're bickering and arguing they're all going in different directions and then we see it on a larger scale of all the countries eventually start to cut communication off from each other yeah and that becomes the main conflict of the movie is because what ends up happening is the every country is 12 uh, pods have showed up in 12 major countries and every country has to work together and communicate uh because they all got different bits of information and all the information from the 12 pods need to be put together for them to properly um uh, translate the message the aliens are trying to send them and as tensions rise uh, because countries are always at butting heads and communication is so difficult in the modern age, even with all this technology, um, everyone becomes at danger, especially because a couple of the major countries, especially China, uh, they threaten to attack the pods and they sever their communications, not wanting to work with the Americans in the other countries. And so it becomes a major crisis, the lack of communication and the inability to empathize with other countries and other people to work together for one common goal. The realism of this film, it really keeps you on the edge of your seat the entire time. You're kind of like waiting on bated breath, scene after scene, trying to see what's going to happen next because the plot to me makes logical sense. Like It feels like it could happen where if, if aliens came to Earth, if we had this crazy astronomical anomaly that, you know, where they come and visit us and and realistically – they don't look anything like us, these aliens, these heptapods, because I think that's one of the ultimate examples of hubris of mankind is we think that aliens will look exactly like us or they'll have yeah. limbs like us. Humanoid. They'll think like us. They'll yeah. have eyes like us. Where really, you can obviously explore the idea that aliens most likely, like these aliens, have different senses that we can't even imagine. They're a different form of self-aware. Um, these heptapods, you know, they, they're... They're clearly similar in a way to octopi to me. Um, obviously, the way they communicate with their tentacles and their hands and the, the ink blots, um, which octopi are actually incredibly intelligent animals and mm. believed to be one of the only other self-aware species on the planet Earth. And an interesting thing about octopi is most of their neurons are actually in their limbs, which actually reminds me of how these aliens kind of communicate so with like their limbs. Their, so like their brains 
brain function in their limbs not technically brain function but like a lot of their their feelings are yeah. actually in their limbs so like oh, cool. yeah so that they they feel a lot throughout their body and yeah <laughs> i think I don't know much about octopi. I'm just I'm just spitting the ball here. He sounds like you do. <laughs> but these these heptapods, we eventually learn are in the way they communicate with those like tentacle like hands. We we think that's their entire size, but then we eventually learn that they're enormous six yeah. six story tall beings. And again, that's just a, an example of that. We don't know what aliens would be like at all. Yeah, and it's it's you're, that's a good point because when we first see them, we think they're small. And then they're gigantic, and it also it makes sense when when you see the when you see what they look like, and then you oh you understand oh that's why the ship is shaped like that because it has I'm sure every story or level of that ship needs to be very tall to fit them in it, and I think I love the the design of them and I love um, the ink blot technology they use. It's like an organic way of communicating that's really fascinating, and uh, the team actually created their own language with these ink blots, and they were actually like made sense and they were really translatable. Um, if you want to translate them into English or another language. So a lot of work went into making these designs, and they made over 100 very specific inkblot circles. And each circle is not – it's not like one word. Each circle can be uh, several sentences or so. So like different patches of each circle, there's like a patch that means one word and a patch that means like a phrase. So uh, the circle connected – all a complete circle is a – more than just like a sentence it could be like a lot of uh, phrases put together yeah i think it's it's really similar to like the chinese language or japanese mm -hmm. languages yeah and um these aliens they're actually we learn are a higher dimensional being that again they perceive time all at once and use future events to influence Luis's present to they're there for humans to help them because at some point they'll need Humans will need their help to to save their existence. How did not How did Christopher Nolan not write this movie? <laughs> <laughs> I figured, yeah, seems like him. Seems like a Nolan movie. But um, I I really love Denis as a filmmaker. He's he like you said, he's one of the best working right now. And one of the strengths to his filmmaking, and it's really evident in this movie, is he, he like Nolan. He's very much all about practical effects and sets. No, like using as as little CGI as possible, using as little green screen as possible, and especially with this this film, that set inside of the spaceship, that's a real set they built in a, in a studio. So they built this gigantic set. I think it was like as big as a football field. Um, and that, that glass screen, that, the glass window where they communicate between with Abbott and Costello, that was real. And uh, I think that that tangibility uh, adds so much realism to the, to the film because the, all the sets in Blade Runner 2049, those are all real. They really built them. And he believes that his actors give their best performances if they're not in front of a green screen. They're on the set, and also the cinematography can be as good as possible when you actually build the set, and then you can light it, rather than doing a green screen, we're like, okay, well, computer, computer enhance where the light will show up and stuff. But I think that building the sets for something like this worked out so well. And basically the plot of the film is Banks and then Donnelly, who's played by Jeremy Renner here very effectively, their, their job is to research and understand this complex language of these aliens and try to communicate with them what they want, why they're there. Um, but there are obviously situations we talked about earlier where all these nations have their own ship and they're they're using their own methods to communicate with the, with the aliens. And for example, I think the Chinese method they're using is they're, they're playing a, a win or lose game to communicate with them, which leads to them thinking that the aliens are there to try to destroy them. Because, yeah, they could confuse thinking they said weapon yeah, rather when, than tool. When really, yeah. So, so Luis tries to explain that it means tool. It doesn't necessarily just mean weapon. Yeah. And in a way, this film isn't really about aliens at all. It's You think it's going to be about an alien invasion or a world war or the destruction of our planet. But really, this film is about life. It's about if you knew your life from beginning to end, would you live that life differently? Or, or what else, what would you do to change it if you would? And, and the thing with Louise that makes her such a such a profound character is she knows what's going to happen and she knows that and it's her, tragic she knows that her 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 daughter is going to live a, a, a horrible life of, of disease and sickness and she's going to die young and she has to go through that pain as well and and her and their the father has to go through the pain as well who we learn is donnelly but she still decides to to relive that fate despite the pain that it causes except what you have even if it's just a little bit except the good that you have in your life and and just live that live your life to the best you can um and like accept the cards you're dealt because louise knowing that that's her daughter 
she could make the decision to never have a relationship with Donnelly, but she doesn't. She just goes on with it. And also, you could you you can also argue that it's kind of like Tenet in a way where everything's already going to happen. It, it's it, it, her loop is predetermined, and she's just experiencing it. And who knows? I mean, she could be. I mean, at, it, she could be any age at this time because her 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 mind is a, is a circle. So it, it, she could have already experienced death. You know what I mean? But this is just like the moment we're seeing in her life. But her mind is on a loop. So it's not like she's going traveling up a hill. She's just moving in a circle. So it's a, you could give yourself a headache thinking about this stuff. But it's really fascinating because I think that she is influenced by her future already before she even starts interpreting the language. Yeah. And the aliens are able to use this to help her uh, find a way of pretty much saving humanity and allowing uh, China to communicate with the rest of the countries by uh, she makes that phone call with the Chinese leader and, and tells him that that line that his dying wife said to him uh, years before that only he knew and that was a, a moment to convince him to uh, change his plan and so the, the heptapods they know that they can influence her um, and once she begins communicating with them they know that she'll she'll be able to uh, use the future to to control the past and a lot of people don't really understand why, why is Louise special? Why does she get the the power of these aliens? It's because she's the only one to fully immerse herself in the alien language. Obviously, all these other countries are making strides in communication and and um, translating some of the vocabulary and, and the symbolism of the aliens. But she's the only one that immerses herself in it completely, which is why she gets the power. And that's why she also is learning as she goes the power of of this experiencing time in a circle and like the phone call you just brought up where she doesn't even remember making the phone call and she's like I called you didn't I yeah. and then so it's a really fascinating concept of it's it's hard to describe and call it time travel Amy Adams was Denis Villeneuve's first choice for Louise she agreed to the role within 24 hours of receiving the script Arrival uh, one of the best sci-fi films made this century it's a masterpiece of Denis Villeneuve one of the best of his career and it's a very rewatchable movie. 100%. This episode of Raiders of the Lost Podcast is sponsored by MoviePosters.com. Use our coupon code RAIDERS15 to get 15% off your order today. Don't get your movie posters on Amazon.com. I know it's free shipping, but the quality is awful. MoviePosters.com is high quality. They have every movie you can think of. They have all sorts of sizes, framing, backlighting, glass, lamination, whatever you want, they can do it. Use our awesome coupon code Raiders15 to get 15% off your order at MoviePosters.com. Again, Raiders15 to get 15% off MoviePosters.com. Next up, we have District 9, which came out in 2009, directed by Neil Blomkamp. Written by Neil Blomkamp and Terry Tatchell. This film stars Charlotte Copley, Jason Cope, Natalie Bolt, and Sylvain Strike. It had a budget of $30 million dollars in a worldwide box office of $210 million. Violence ensues after an extraterrestrial race forced to live in slum-like conditions on Earth finds a kindred spirit in a government agent exposed to their biotechnology. I really love this film because of its approach to the material because, like you said earlier, we've seen plenty of uh, alien invasion movies and uh, it's all done in the same style, but Neil Blomkamp had a really great vision where he shot this film to be a documentary, and it, it's uh, half the footage is interviews with people talking about the m events of the film after the fact, which adds a lot of curiosity to what's going to happen to Vickis as the story's progressing, and um, I think it's a really brilliant way because it makes it feel real. It's shot documentary style with, combined with the interviews, it makes it feel like these are real events. And I also really love how uh, the aliens came in the 80s. They, they didn't just arrive like Arrival. They came decades before, and now uh, the humans who control the land uh, in South Africa, where they landed, uh, they're just doing whatever they can to you know, keep them separate, but also like uh, it's a place for them to be. And so it's been a problem for a long time in this world. Yeah, so these aliens who were referred to as prawns, they're stranded on Earth while they were in transit to their home world. And they have comparative technology um, though years ahead of humans, uh, and they have like unique biotechnology, which is really cool. It only works with their DNA, um, which is why MNU can't figure out how their weapons work or figure out how to use them. Um, the prawns are much larger and stronger than humans, and the, the creature design is fascinating. They're like giant insect-like, um, 
monsters kind of like <laughs> alien. it's really cool and they're like they're, reptilian and, kind of yeah, yeah. and they're they're incredibly powerful they're also um very capable at surviving in these slums although they're horrible conditions because you know th- th- as soon as they they're 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 able to live off like any kind of meat they can find and they're yeah. they're addicted to cat food which is funny but also sad at the same time because i think this film has a lot of subliminal messages like i think the cat food is a representation of drugs for these slum like areas in the real world but this film mm-hmm. is and and the entire movie is a giant allegory really for um obviously apartheid in south africa which neil the director uh, grew up during and uh, he this is an allegory a metaphor for that but also just the, the vast differences in in drastic social classes of, of specific countries and, and a lot of countries actually but you know there are there are many countries where the social class structure is drastically different in terms of like the upper class and lower class yeah and- because segregation is a main theme in this movie and you see several signs throughout the film in the city in Johannesburg like the signs will have it will say no prawns allowed and you'll see images of like the cartoon drawings of a of a prawn on signs and i think the marketing campaign for this film was brilliant because one of the main posters was a target board in the shape of a prawn with target holes in it from bullsh- from gunshots and show- and so that poster showed that uh the the aliens are here but they're viewed as enemies and as like lesser than beings blend that with the actual segregation of the prawns in the slum of district 9 and it's a really powerful film, like you said. It's a great allegory for those themes. The sad thing is, a lot of countries still have slums like this, and you know these people. They were a lot of them were born into poverty, which they'll never be able to escape, or have fled their homelands from war or turmoil, or just in bad situations, and then they're left in these horrible situations in these other countries, dependent on them and dependent on. I think at first they explained that the the humans were you know generous and helpful of the prawns at first, but then eventually decades pass and they're they're sick of it, and that's why they have this MNU organization, which is a weapons manufacturer they're in charge of basically the eviction of these aliens and you can kind of assume what they mean by eviction of these aliens the refugee crisis is is still very relevant today there are actually there are still millions of refugees throughout um uh, asia and the middle east and eastern europe and especially there's there's 700,000 people have escaped syria and yemen because of civil war and and famine and so a lot of people hundreds of thousands of people are literally stranded in camps in the desert outside of city lines because they aren't allowed into the city and so the cu- countries will build these fenced off areas with just tents and families live there for years like with nowhere to go so these issues they're still relevant and i don't think they'll 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 never not be relevant yeah and again this film is incredibly smart it's a very unique action and has like like we've been talking about a lot of deep meanings and i think neil blomkamp is a a very talented director and he was originally tasked with making a Halo short film, and they were hoping that he could make the entire the feature length film of that movie, which would which would have been amazing because yeah, I love Halo. Yeah, I remember they they released the short film yeah, online. It was it's sick. on YouTube. You can yeah. watch it. It's a seven minute short. It's really cool, and it makes you wish the full movie was made. But I guess the the studio execs hated what he did with it. But I, I had suggest watching. It's very cool. But he has this really unique style as a director, where he kind of creates his own aesthetic of the world, where he he blends like. A lot of these slum-like worlds with future technology, like we see um, in Chappie, or we saw it in um, Elysium. So he has this this unique vision, I think, of how he sees things. Yeah, hundred percent. And his voice is clear. And the, I think that he has a love for the documentary style of cinematography, uh, which he's used in all of his films so far because it adds the realism. And I I think that his other two films they're they're very good, but they weren't quite the caliber of this film. And I would like to just, I honestly would like to see him do something that's not set in like a slum environment, um, maybe dealing with different issues and themes and maybe still technology based, but a little different from these three. Because I feel like his three films so far, they are very similar in tone and theme. Elysium was cool, but also same kind of thing. So I think uh, for his fourth film, I'd really like to see him take a, a fresh approach to a new story. I agree. and But I do think his decision to choose Charlton Copley as the lead of this film, who was not an actor before the movie was made. I think it was really smart because, like we talk about, the first act and first half of this film is like this fake documentary style of filmmaking. And I think Charlto's he's phenomenal in this movie, but his amateur style of acting, I think, and his unrecognizable face adds so much to the aspect of it being a documentary that like you don't know who this guy is. He's not a movie star. You've never seen him on camera before. He's a good actor, but he still has amateurish qualities to his acting, but it makes it seem more real. Yeah, that's a great point. And Charlto is, I, I love him. I think he's a great actor. He's in, he's really great in Old Boy. He's in 
Maleficent and the A Team. He's been in a ton of stuff since this movie, and he, he this was kind of like an unplanned accident because he was a TV producer in South Africa in his twenties, and then he actually hired Neil Blomkamp while he was a teenager to work as a graphic design artist for the TV studio he was running in. And they worked together for years, and Charlto was his boss for years. And then Neil Blomkamp made a short film about District 9, and he had Charlto act in it for a few small scenes as like a character like Vickis. And they worked out really well, and he cast him as the lead in the movie when they got funding from Peter Jackson, who loved the short. So this movie got made because of Peter Jackson. He saw the short, loved it, and gave them a lot of money to make the film. And... I think that it's this crazy story of how Charlotte and Neil Blomkamp, they had such a long working history, a small time, and then they made it big, and they have just uh, their careers have just exploded since District 9. So the film follows Vickis, played by Charlotte, who, who works for this company that's basically trying to evict all these aliens from District 9, which is the slum area that they live in. And it's, it's really sad to see what's happened to these aliens and how they're living and how they've had to be, how they forced to adapt to these conditions. And again, the cat food, which is kind of funny at first, but it really shows like how humans exploit them with the cat food and, and get technology from them with the cat food and get answers. And I, I like to compare it to drugs on streets where, um, you know, we, we hear all these stories and re- read all these books and, and conspiracies of, you know, a lot of these drug syndicates are funded by the government organizations of different countries. So they're putting st- drugs on the streets to control their populations in a way. Um, you can see that obviously is be- being done here in the slums with, with the cat food. And so Vickis, he's he's going through these slums and uh, the main turning point of the film is Vickis becomes exposed to this alien uh, fuel, which infects him. Yeah, and it's, a, and it's an amazing story because... Uh, he goes through the physical transformation of turning into a prawn slowly by day by day. And eventually his arm is just full prawn. And it's a really fascinating take on the story. And I think that's why it works so well, because at first Vickis is kind of in, he's very inhumane to the prawns and because he's showing, he's like giving people a tour of the, of district nine of the slums as he's like going house by house. And he's like talking to the aliens as if like they are inferior beings and uh, he has no respect for them. Um, and then as he slowly begins turning into one, he realizes that they are, they're just, they're not people, but they are beings too, and they have minds and souls themselves, and uh, he becomes more empathetic towards them, and he he becomes dependent on them, because uh, uh, that alien, Christopher, ends up being his an aide to him, and an ally, and uh, they develop a, a friendship, and uh, it gets to the point where Vickis even sac- like risks his life to save Christopher from from the uh, enforcement. Yeah, I think what Bloomkamp is trying to say with this film and with the story of of Vickis turning into a prawn is he's trying to say, imagine what it's like living in someone else's shoes, someone who lives in a, a place like this who's had this difficult life. And, you know, most governments and societies, we treat our lowest class citizens like the prawns are treated in this movie in District 9. And by turning Vickis into a prawn, He's experienced life, experiencing life in their shoes and their bodies as a refugee, as a member of the most disenfranchised population on Earth, the super poor. And in a way, ironically, through his transformation, and even once he's fully transformed into a prawn at the end of the film, Vickis becomes more human the less human he is. Yeah. And he also clings to that humanity still, though, by, you know, he leaves that metal flower out. For his wife to find, so he becomes more human, I think, at the end of the movie. Yeah, hundred percent. And this film makes exceptional use of uh, practical set, pra- practical footage with CGI. Uh, and this is two thousand nine, so uh, CGI was a lot better, but it still wasn't like how it is right now. And Blomkamp, with a budget of only thirty million dollars, he made some of the most impressive visuals you had seen because he combined uh, this high concept sci-fi style with documentary footage style and it brought that even though the even if the cgi doesn't look perfect the handheld quality makes it more believable you know what i mean that makes you accept it more and they were really smart about how they shot it you know it's not like uh, they, they keep the lighting very minimal and very naturalistic and uh very simple and i think that helps with the cgi as well but the the prawns look fantastic i i think that it's a it's a beautiful film and I think the most iconic shot, it's, I remember from the trailer when I first saw it, it's, it shows a shot of um, people on a helicopter, and it's, it shows the, the ship, the mothership above Earth, just 
in the background and it looked so fantastic and so realistic and it was a very powerful image and I think that's one of the reasons that that caught people's attention for this film. Yeah, the third act of the film, Vickis's goal changes to helping Christopher and his son escape because Vickis, he, he's turning into a prawn and Christopher hints at that they have technology on their mothership that can reverse what's going on to him and change him back into a human. But obviously he gets captured and MNU just wants to experiment on Vickis because he's able to fire the guns and they're, they've been trying to to get the biotech and, and weaponry working. Um, but there's this, there's this great dilemma where Vickis wants to help Christopher for his own selfish needs, but uh, he also asks Christopher... Um, if he lets him, if he helps him escape and he travels back to his home planet, what's going to happen then? Is there going to be a war? Because obviously Christopher is going to tell the prawn species or planet what they're being treated like on Earth. So how can he guarantee a war will not start? Um, I wish this had a movie had a, a sequel to kind of explore that idea in a way. But it's also really fascinating that there's also a cool theory that so this fuel turns you into a prawn. What if all the prawns that's not their actual original uh, being. Maybe that's not their actual life form or, or bodies. Maybe they use this prawn fuel technology to to change their bodies during space travel or or some other. As like a, like an organic exosuit. Yeah, kind of like that. So uh -huh. maybe maybe that's not even what they look like. Which is why why would they even have technology that reverses the effect of the prawn suit and the prawn being? So maybe that's that. Maybe they're not even. They don't even look like that. Maybe they look more like us. If 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 they had the technology done on themselves to reverse it. That's a really cool point. I never thought about that. That's fascinating. Yeah, because that makes sense because why would the fuel cause that kind of effect on on a human? Yeah, and why yeah. would they have reverse technology for it? Yeah, that's pretty wild. I think this I think this movie it, I would definitely be excited if they made a sequel to this. That's a fascinating area to explore for the film. But all in all, I think it's it has such powerful messages and uh, Blomkamp did it in such a, a great way with the tech, and it's it's hard to believe that this movie doesn't have a budget of 150 million dollars. It's it's fantastic looking. It's great, and for a debut, I mean, you can't think of a better debut for this because this movie became a pop culture phenomenon uh, when it came out in 2009. Yeah, very viral marketing yeah. campaigns. Yeah, the marketing campaign was genius, and it's it it was the rare uh, occasion of a science fiction film getting nominated for an Oscar for Best Picture because, like we talked about on the Dark Knight podcast, after the Dark Knight got snubbed. Uh, the Oscars changed the, the uh, number of nominees from anywhere between five and ten nominees. And so I think this year in 2009, I think nine films got nominated and District 9 made the cut, whereas it, it probably wouldn't have made the cut if it was still a five only nominee category bracket. If you like our podcast, the best thing you can do to support us is share us with your friends, your movie buddies, your family. We're growing mostly word of mouth. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts. Hit the notification bell so you know when new episodes are coming out. And to becoming a patron on patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast, patrons get specific perks like personalized messages, personalized video messages, and top tier patrons get a monthly shout out on the podcast. Next up, we have Looper, which was written and directed by Ryan Johnson and released September 28th, 2012. This film stars Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Bruce Willis, Emily Blunt, and Paul Dano. Looper grossed $176 million on a budget of $30 million. In 2074, when the mob wants to get rid of someone, the target is sent into the past, where a hired gun awaits. Someone like Joe, who one day learns the mob, wants to close the loop by sending back Joe's future self for assassination. Like we said earlier, a lot of these films, they took the same things we had seen before, and they had new twists on it and new takes on it, and uh, Looper had this really fresh take on the time travel uh, genre in terms of uh, the the job of a looper, and I think it's a, a brilliant sci-fi film. It's so well made, so well acted, and uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt this uh, solidified his status as a leading man in Hollywood. And also, I think this was Emily Blunt's, you could argue, biggest breakout, uh, being the the supporting actress in this film um, because she was fantastic. She played a very strong uh, female character, and Bruce Willis really brought it with this. You could argue this is his last great movie that he was in. Yeah, I love this movie so much so that I, bl I bought it on Blu-ray the year it came out. And I think Ryan Johnson's a great director, like I said earlier. Uh, despite what everyone says of The Last Jedi, Looper is a phenomenally original film that blew me away. It's complex. It looks great. Um, Ryan and JGL are actually great friends, and he wrote this part specifically for Joe. And, you know, there are characteristics that he gave the character, like learning to speak French because JGL speaks f French fluently. Um, and I think the concept of it is so freaking cool by the mob take care, takes care of their, their hits by sending them back in time. So there's no trace of the hit in the future world because, because of, a 
um, tracking technology. It's almost impossible to make someone disappear. And obviously, we're dealing with time travel here. So there's going to be a lot of paradoxes. And sometimes sometimes the story might not make total sense. And you can argue that, how is this possible if this happens? How is this possible if that happens? But I think what Ryan Johnson does with the dialogue, too, is multiple times he's like, don't talk about space travel. Don't talk about time travel to me. Let's just let's just talk about something else because we'll be here all day talking about it. Yeah, you can. I mean, you could argue that Terminator is impossible. The story, the grandfather yeah. paradox. You know what I mean? So, so same so kind of thing. You can't think about it too hard. You can just allow it to happen and just have fun with it. Like yeah. this movie. Yeah, he just kind of leaves it simple. Just these are the rules. Let's not explain it too quickly. We send people back in time to be assassinated and killed, um, despite the paradoxes that could be involved in time travel. What I really like about this movie in terms of the production design is that uh, it's a sci-fi uh, futuristic film uh, set in the future. Not too far, but far enough. And I like how the world, it's not like, it's neither dystopian and neither utopian. It's very much, it feels like our world. And I think that's what the future will be like. It's not, I don't think the changes are going to be that drastic 40 years from now. I don't think it's going to be so much different. Obviously, technologies will improve, but like, for example, em- Emily Blunt's character, she lives in a rural, rural area of the city, of the, of the state, and she still lives on a farm, and she lives a very simple life. So I think no matter how advanced technology gets, even 100 years from now, 200 years from now, there are still going to be areas of the country that are just still rural and very simple. And yeah, they might have cool pieces of technology, but it's not going to be like super sci-fi crazy tech, you know, because the country's so big. That technology, no matter how amazing it is, it's not going to spread everywhere. So there's going to be large areas of the world of, of the world and of America that are still going to be very simple and, and crude with, in terms of technology. Well, yeah, the entirety of the city and, and the technology, yeah, there's there's some advanced technology, but I mean, Joe drives like a 2008 Miata. Like, yeah. It's not like things have progressed greatly like and in, in exponentially because it seems like the world has, has hit kind of like a... a a plateau, mm-hmm. even though there's some new tech, and obviously we have these interesting ideas of these telekinetic powers, where 10 percent of the population has developed telekinetic powers, where mostly they can just balance a, a coin above their hand. It's more like a social status thing now. Yeah, for real. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm gonna point out real quick right now that the plot of Deadpool two is basically a ripoff of Looper. It's l- like really yeah. hard ripoff. It, it's like the same freaking movie. Mm-hmm. It is what it is. It's Hollywood. But I just want to point that out, that Looper came up with these ideas first. Yeah, because the kid, the fire kid in Deadpool 2, he's pretty much Rainmaker. the same character as the Rainmaker, the kid in this movie. Yeah, same so exact story. Same concept. And then Josh Brolin is uh, sent back to try and to kill him to save his family from dying. It's the same exact uh, story. But we got to digress. It's Hollywood. Yeah. But I think the decision to use Joseph Gordon-Levitt's face with prosthetics, did it hurt or help the film or the character portrayal of, of the young Joe? I think... It was a little weird at first, but you get used to it while you're watching the movie. But I would have not minded it at all if they didn't do any prosthetic work on Joseph Gordon-Levitt at all. I would have accepted it totally. I mean, they're different actors, so it may have been a little bit of overkill. I think if you just learn the voice and the mannerisms of Bruce, which he did really well, you don't need the prosthetic work. But I think Ryan Johnson just kind of wanted to give it an, an extra edge. Yeah, I, I, I can. it can go both ways. I agree with you. I don't think they had to do it, but I think it was... With what they did, it, it it was fantastic. I mean, they Joseph Gordon-Levitt wore prosthetics on his jaw, on his mouth, on his nose, and so I think they they wanted to show that it really was him because for those shots at the diner where they're both sitting at the table, and you see the profile of them because they even arched Joseph Gordon-Levitt's nose with prosthetics the same way that Bruce Willis's nose arches in a profile, and the lips. The, the same lips and so I think when you see them sitting together um, having that coffee and talking it, it, it really makes it feel like they are the same person you know what I mean so I, I understand it could they could have done it without it but I think it was really cool how they did it and it looked great I, I like you said it's weird at first because you know what Gordon Levitt looks like but uh, five ten minutes into the movie you accept it and you're like okay this is this is Joe in this movie and in terms of uh, the plot I think it was really um, great because the antagonist of the movie is the protagonist you know what i mean it's you've never seen that with time travel where the main character um the villain they're all going up against is themselves. and i thought it was a really uh, exciting and uh, refreshing way to tell this a time travel story and i i adore that that diner scene because when they first get together you think the conversation might go well because they're the same person they might want to like team up or something but they end up being extremely antagonistic with one another, and they, their ideologies and their goals completely clash. So they really become 
their enemies in this movie. And I thought it was so cool to see the same person and enemies with himself. Yeah, it's really interesting. And we learned that although time travel is declared illegal once it's been discovered in the future, the mob and crime syndicates cheat and use it as a method for disposing of its enemies. And being a looper, it's a highly lucrative profession in this kind of uh, impoverished new future world that that they're living in, the, the distant future. Um, but it also comes with the stipulation that once your time comes and your like looper career is over, you will be sent back for termination and you will be killed by yourself which means closing your loop when, when you're the young version of yourself and you kill the old version of yourself. So the loopers never know when this is going to occur, when when they're going to get sent back, the the old version of themselves. And the way the assassinations take place, it's really cool how yeah. they're just like standing there waiting and Joe's just like looking at the t- t- ticking clock, like listening to French translations in his ear, and then just suddenly someone appears screaming. And it's, it's actually really a cool uh, sequence where Ryan Johnson takes you in like the day in the life of a looper or the week in the life of a looper. So that's a great point. There are two really great great montages in this movie and i think that uh montages they can be an important part of a movie and and so the first montage is that where you see what joe's life is like being a looper what he does for fun in his free time he's a drug addict he he's a criminal but he has friends and he wants to move to paris and he also kills people on, uh, as this uh, assassin and it's this great like five minute montage that really establishes the character in the world and then the second montage I think is one of my favorite parts of the movie where um, even though Joe's path is on this is on this trajectory in the movie, uh, Ryan Johnson wisely shows us the older Joe's path and what happened to him after um, the moment in this film, um, which is like the, the deciding factor of him uh, leaving the country and moving to China. When he actually did close yeah, his loop. Yeah, when he did close his loop in because uh, that's what the older Joe did. The Bruce Willis Joe closed his loop at this age and then just lived his life with uh, whatever savings he had left. And I think it's a really amazing montage of seeing him age uh, into his 50s. And um, even though he had a ton of money, he spent it all, became a drug addict, and um, he became a criminal again just to earn money. And and then uh, Bruce Willis is Joe. He He's motivated by the loss of his wife who saved his life, and she became the most important person in his life. And... Uh, after she is killed, that is the motivating factor for Bruce Willis's Joe to travel back in time and stop the Rainmaker when he's a child. And so Bruce Willis's character goes, he does some really horrible things and he acts up a storm in this. He does a really great job in this movie, especially like after he kills that kid and you see him like breaking down under the bridge. Um, so he, Bruce Willis's Joe does horrible things, but you you can empathize with him because he's motivated to save the life of his wife and also to stay, to save the future from this rainmaker villain. Closing your loop, it's an it's an odd situation to think about. Like you kill your older self, then you get this huge payday. I'm sure it's a really weird feeling. I mean, obviously they all celebrate and they live their life because they they've they've closed their loop and they basically have an early retirement and they get to enjoy the next couple decades of their life until it's time to go back in time and be murdered. And would you kill an older version of yourself? I mean, if it's part of your destiny, what difference does it really make? But also factor in that traveling through time, it creates different realities and different paradoxes. And so you're really killing the current version of your young self, or are you killing a different version of yourself that's been sent into this timeline or the future version of, of an alternate you and again, we don't want you don't want to spend too much time thinking about the paradoxes of this film and everything. And it's it's almost kind of like not taking care of your body or overindulging in abusive substances at a young age. Where at t- at the time it's awesome and it's fun, and you're having a good time, but you're not thinking about what your body's going to be like in 40 years because of this and the damage you're doing. Yeah, and this movie has a great twist. I mean, obviously you can tell it coming when we learn that the the rainmaker from Bruce Willis's Joe's world is actually Sid, the little boy who lives on the farm and. Uh, we slowly see um, hints and reveals of his immense power in TK. And um, it's it's really fascinating because this kid is destined to become the Rainmaker, but we don't know how because his mother seems to be a mother who really loves him. So it's kind of curious. Like, you're wondering, how does, it, how does he become such a horrible monster? And then Joe understands that the Bruce Willis Joe, and by coming back in time to kill Sid as a child he will fail and eventually will create the Rainmaker because it will kill his mother in the process. So then he knows that uh, he has to sacrifice himself in order to save this young boy and stop himself. 
from doing it. And it's a really powerful climax to the film, and I was very moved by it. And uh, when 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 Joe turns the blunderbuss on himself, you're like, no, but he had to do it. Yeah, but this film has a lot of great uh, ideas, too, of like, obviously, older Joe survives the assassination and killing uh, by the younger Joe, and we have two Joes in the same timeline, the same error because he failed to kill his Lupin. Earlier in the film, Seth, who play, who's played by Paul Daniel, he fails to kill his Lupin. Uh, Joe hides his friend Seth and eventually gives him up, though. But one of the most disturbing scenes of the film is the older version, Seth, running away and trying to catch that train, but then his, his limbs and fingers start to disappear. Oh, I love that so scene. So it's really disturbing to watch each finger, and then they start... Then with, his nose. Then his nose, then his then his limbs, and he's, he's eventually crawling back to the crime, the criminals to, to stop uh, cutting off Seth Seth's limbs. But again... This introduces the paradox of how could Seth become a loop or, or continue his life if his limbs are being yeah, cut off? So, yeah, like he would have never been able to come back. So again, yeah. the, uh, there are examples of this paradox, but you just got to kind of accept it and go with the flow of the movie. Yeah, exactly. You can't think too hard on it. Just let the movie happen, and it's very entertaining. Like that scene, I just my stomach just turned thinking about it. It's, yeah. it's extremely disturbing in a great way. It's it's such such a unique scene. I loved it. But then there's this great other paradox at the end of the movie so so joe sacrifices himself to ensure that his mother doesn't get killed and the the child becomes the rainmaker but but i mean sid yes he'll grow up with his mother now and will grow up with love so maybe he won't become the rainmaker but or willie i mean sid technically thinks that sarah's sister is his mother and he continually talks about the rumors of the rainmaker is that he watched his mother die which he says he watched his mother die when she actually when he accidentally killed her they also talk about how the Rainmaker has the prosthetic jaw. He still gets shot in the face by Bruce Willis's character, Old Joe. Um, so these all still kind of happen. So what if, even though Joe sacrifices himself and kills himself, what if the Rainmaker still comes to fruition is, and he Sid still becomes the Rainmaker? And then also, that's real dark. We have this consistency paradox where if you go back in time and kill your younger self, you'll never have existed. So how could the events of the story even take place in general? So again, lots of different like plot holes but i think i think johnson leaves it open-ended with what i just said before that on purpose to make you think yeah 100 percent. but i and i understand that the rainmaker st could still come to to fruition but i think that at the end of the film sid sid does accept that she's his mother and she, he always knew i think but i think that because he's a very intelligent little kid and the actor who played him like i don't understand how this little kid can act so well at the age of like what three four no he's like six dude no way that kid was like <laughs> four when they made this he's little and and he's amazing as a, a child actor, but he is very intelligent. I think that he was denying that she was his mother out of spite because he knows that she left him. And so I think yeah. at the end of the film, he accepts that she's his mother because they hug and he calls her mommy. So I think that he won't become the Rainmaker because they finally established that they're going to have a, mo a, a mother, a, a maternal relationship with one another. And they also get that the gold, the gold, uh, they also got the gold at the end of the film, so she'll be able to provide him with a comfortable life. And she she clearly is uh, highly motivated to be as good a mother to him as possible because she feels guilty for abandoning him when he was born and to live her life and have fun in the city. And, and I think that she's motivated to make up for that. And so I think she's going to try to do her best to provide uh, a loving environment for him and to make Sid use his powers for good in the future. So I don't think the Rainmaker will be created now. I can see that. Yeah, but it's, you have a good point. Overall, though, this is a phenomenal movie, and when you don't think about it too hard, it's very entertaining, really great script, great acting, and some of the visuals are stunning too and, and incredibly disturbing, not just the, the limbs disappearing, but also when, <laughs> when Sid kills uh, the, the gunman, the, oh, the, yeah. the Gatman at the farmhouse, and yeah. he, he just hovers him in the air and just like disperses the the blood out of his body yeah, it's, it's not so crazy and so really cool effects lots of cool concepts interesting themes lots of paradoxes of course because it's time travel but overall i love this movie yeah th this movie's great and i think this is this movie is what got ryan johnson uh on board to make a star wars movie because it's so good source code released in 2011 directed by duncan jones written by ben ripley this film stars jake gyllenhaal michelle monaghan vera Farmiga and Jeffrey Wright. With a budget of $32 million, this film had a worldwide box office of $147 million. A soldier wakes up in someone else's body and discovers he's part of an experimental government program to find the bomber of a commuter train within eight minutes. I, I adore this movie. It's got a brilliant script and um, a great story. And it's a very small movie. It's just set on one location for the most part. And 
uh, Jake Gyllenhaal carries the film, and it's a showcase to his ability to be a great actor, but also handle action and, and special effects and sci-fi. And uh, Duncan Jones proved himself because Moon was great, but not that many people saw Moon. I think he made like seven million. And then with Source Code, he finally got a, he got a big budget, and he had a big movie star to work with, and they made a, they crafted an amazing movie, and it made uh, almost two hundred million dollars, so it was a big hit. And I think they knocked it out of the park with this. It's a really fun take on the idea of simulations, the idea of multiverses. And uh, also, if you're a fan of video games, this this movie is like, it's kind of like watching a video game. Yeah, in a way. And Duncan Jones, incredibly talented young director, son of David Bowie, we've talked about on our other podcasts. This movie, it's a great blend of mystery, suspense, science fiction. Again, we're dealing with themes of not really time travel, so to say, but alternate realities, virtual realities. Um, Jake's character, Coulter, one of the strengths of the film is he's entirely clueless to what's going on, just like the audience as we watch it. And Jake brings this vulnerability to the character, so we, we feel immensely for him. And the first time the bomb goes off, we experience that with him too in there, there's and what's a, great is we think it's real the first time. Yeah, so there are a lot of emotional scenes in this movie of, of this character, Coulter, and um, like him, we're trying to answer these questions. Why Why am I here? Uh, who put me here? Where, what am I here for? Is this real? Why Why am I on this plane? Why, why when I look in the mirror, there's another man's face and not mine? Um, and so Coulter deals with a lot of emotions in this film. He has to accept the fact that his body is nearly dead and it's on life support and there's no way he will ever live a normal life again because the the setup of this film is that he was a, a army pilot, an air force pilot who crashed and his body was completely destroyed and um, the army, the military, uh, put him on life support and they entered his mind into the simulation program and the simulation program uh, is designed in order to prevent terrorist attacks from happening by investigating past attacks. So, for example, in this film. Um, a series of terrorist attacks are being carried out and the first one happened on a train and they want to stop another one from happening because based on their intel, there's going to be more attacks on the city. And they're able to use this person's last eight minutes of memories to reconstruct the scene of the crime. And so it's like a kind of like a who done it mystery in a simulation. And Coulter has eight minutes each time to try and figure out either a new clue or who the bomber actually is so that he can provide intel to the military superiors so that they can stop the next attack from happening. Yeah, so he, in the, he's in this body of this man named Sean Fentress, who's a teacher, and the, the, each time he's put back into source code, he opens up talking to this this woman um, who he's never met before, Christina, played by Michelle Monaghan. And each time we're, we're put back into... Source code, we make it a little further, just like a video game where we're trying to figure things out, figure out the level. and But also throughout his, his mission that he has is forced to accept, he's developing uh, feelings for this, this woman, Christina, and he, he's really starting to like her. But he's also dealing with a lot of guilt of his past where Coulter left his family to grieve for his death. And the last conversation he had with his father was a fight. And... He actually, while in the program, while in source code, as Sean Fentress uses a, a cell phone to, to call home and communicate with them, and he, he calls his father, and it's a really emotional scene where his father answers, and Coulter obviously pretends to be Fentress, and his father explains that all that came back of his son was Ash, despite him actually still being alive, and it's it's really powerful because Coulter tells him that you know he he died with his he was there when his son died and. He just wanted him to know that he loved him and that he was sorry. And But this is important because it's kind of a hint to what the eventuality of the simulation is doing. Because when I first saw this movie, when he made the phone call to his father, I was thinking, oh, he's calling his father in the real world yeah. from within the simulation. But what we find out is that each new version of the source code is creating its own universe, its own alternate reality. And so a, a multiverse is being created through this program. And so when Coulter called his father, he wasn't talking to the, his father in the real world. He was talking to the version of his father in this dimension, this alternate reality that the source code has created. And at first, we, we and Coulter think that this is just an eight-minute loop and that's it. There's nothing beyond that because at the end of each eight minutes, the train blows up and he fails every time. So it seems as though that's the end of the program. There's nothing beyond that. But we find out that at the end, when he finally stops the train and stops the explosion from happening, 
it doesn't stop. The simulation keeps carrying on because what happened is the simulation, every time it is turned on, it creates its own alternate reality. And so each, this, multiverse, this multiverse has been created now. And Vera Farmiga's character, Goodwin, she's also dealing with uh, her own personal moral crisis where she has a job to do. She works for this organization. She works for Source Code. Um, but at what cost is she doing this job? They're, they're trying to save lives, yes, but they're exploiting the life of another human being. Is it moral? Is it ethical? Um, and during that scene when Sean calls his father, Goodwin opens up the chamber that Coulter's real body is in, and he's just, he's just half a human physically, and he's, he's in a vegetative state, and you see what they've turned him into. He's, he's essentially a computer part. He's a, he's a biotech slave to source code, and, and he's used like a tool at the will of his programmers, and to actually see his face and see his body, this really changes Goodwin's perception of the program and, and the job she's doing there. And she this is, helps her to d decide to help Coulter to to help him live through that eight minutes and see what happens. And it's really cool because when he and Christine Christina kiss and time kind of freezes in source code for, for a couple seconds, but then it, it starts to keep going because the simulation's like, oh, we're not over. Yeah. Because like you said, it's creating a new universe. Yeah, it's a great point. And because on top of that, Goodwin is struggling with the, the fact that Rutledge, um, played by Jeffrey Wright, her superior, once uh, Colton figured out who the bomber was, he wants to reset Coulter's mind and put him into another simulation in the future. And so he wants to put Coulter through the simulations over and over and over again and use him as a tool indefinitely, which is just a, an inhumane way to treat uh, a person. And so Goodwin, after empathizing with Coulter enough by speaking with him and communicating with him so often, she decides to make that move and alter the course of Rutledge's plan in favor of Coulter. And then it's so fascinating what happens at the end of the film after after he succeeds and stops the bomber and we're progressing eight past eight minutes into this new world and him and Christina go to the Millennium Park and he sends this really cool text message to um, to Goodwin. To Goodwin, he sends this text message to Goodwin, which she receives before the mission even starts, before he gets put even into source code, telling her that uh, you helped, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a Captain Coulter who is going to be put into source code today. You helped him, you helped avert a mission. Source code works better than anyone could have imagined. And it's really interesting where she doesn't tell Jeffrey Wright's character, her superior officer, what happened and how they actually prevented this explosion from happening, but because it was in a different reality, in a different universe. And that begs the question, maybe that already happened and they didn't show it. Before this Coulter, there was another Coulter in a different yeah. simulation before this movie who texted Goodwin and we just didn't see it shown on camera. And then that then the, the events played out like that. So maybe this has happened many times. Maybe this could have happened infinite number of times yeah, and over the, and over and over and, and over cool again. The thing about it is Steven's Coulter is now split into into two separate places at the same time technically because he's he's got, got his body at source code headquarters in that little chamber but he's also his consciousness is inside the body of Sean Fentress in this new version of reality in that source code that exceeded the 8 minutes but there's also a, a Sean Fentress that survived I'm sure and that's living his life somewhere else too and on a separate reality he's probably living out a life as well so there, I think there are infinite simulations of source code with this exact thing playing out over and over again. I think that's what's so cool when you think about this movie because the, uh, the possibilities are, are endless with this. So this movie really makes you think, and again, maybe not as many paradoxes as Looper, but also the technology is ridiculous, but you kinda <laughs> just got to accept it. As long yeah. as the technology... It tells the story in a really effective way for me when I'm dealing with a sci-fi movie like this, where obviously this is impossible. But if it tells the story effectively, then I completely accept it. I have no problem at all. Yeah, and I love when the scope of, of movies like this are small, where the, the, the plot of the movie just takes place on this train, and it's all about figuring out how to stop the explosion. That's it. No end of the world, no gigantic global disaster. It's just real small and real simple, and I love that about this film, and I think that's why it works so well, because it's very high concept ideas but told in a very simple way a really cool fun fact about the filming of this movie is that while filming scenes jake gyllenhaal had an earbud in during train sequences into which director duncan jones would start playing music at different points of time or or make him disoriented with random songs and static buzz to to help the character become disoriented 
and Jake Gyllenhaal was actually the one who suggested um, Duncan Jones to direct this movie after seeing Moon, which um, was a phenomenal movie, and obviously Jake Gyllenhaal really liked it. These are four amazing science fiction films, and uh, science fiction, the genre, has elevated every decade, and the movies just get better, and the ideas in these films get deeper. Uh, and I think ultimately all these films talk about eventually the same idea, which is humanity and what it means to be human. And I think that the use of technology or alien life or time travel can be used as a way to think about life and think about what it's like to be human. And that's it for episode 55 of Raiders of the Lost podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Take care, everyone. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost podcast. Hit that subscribe button and notification bell. Listen to the audio formats of Raiders of the Lost podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and wherever you listen to podcasts. New episodes every Monday and Thursday. Support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost podcast.